just playing some piano there. But you know what's got nothing to do with playing the piano? The precision of your floating point computations. And in today's video, what I want to do is share an interesting method for doubling the precision of your floating point computations. This is a trick called Double Double Arithmetic and it hails all the way from 1971. Would you believe? And it's just one of those tricks that when you first come across it, you sort of think, well, that's not going to work. No, look, look that, that, that won't work because you'd have to. That, that, that's not going to work because you, if you, that you'd have to. But the more that you think about it, the more you realize that it does work and it's actually quite ingenious. And the other thing that I want to say is just a huge thank you to the uh, Patreons for supporting the channel. I'm sorry that I haven't uploaded for a little while, but um, hopefully we can get on top of things now. We've got an ebook coming your way, and I've also recorded another intro to this video. Uh, but I think, I think I might just put that up for the Patreons as well. It just depends if I can get it edited to something watchable. So in today's video, I want to introduce a double double arithmetic, just a general concept, as well as the OG behind it, the man himself. And I also want to introduce two of the uh, simple operations, and then we'll do a two-parter. So in the next video, we'll do the, uh, the other two operations, it's multiplication and division. Share it with all of your friends, everybody that's into doubling their precision of the floating point unit inside their personal computer. And uh, without further ado, let's do this. Uh, double, double arithmetic. Okay, suppose that we've got a small computer system and the data in this system only has two decimal digits. So we could store the number 12, for example, or 48 or 92, whatever, so long as it's only two digits. Let's also suppose that the system is floating point. So we get to put a decimal point anywhere we like. So if we take the number 48, for example, that could be 48.0, or it could mean 4.8, or it could be a very small number, maybe 0.000048. Or it could be a larger number, so we could have 48,000, etc. But the important thing is that there's only two decimal digits. And they're always together, so we couldn't have 4.0008, for example, because the digits are too far apart. Now this is actually pretty close to the way that real floating point works, except that real floating point is, is just more accurate. A single precision float's got about six decimal digits of accuracy, and a double precision float has, has got about 15 or so. But this is pretty much how it goes. So you've just got some number of accurate digits and then you can put a radix point wherever you want. Hence the name floating point. Let's say that using our little system, we've got two variables, x, which is set to 51, and another variable called y, which is set to 6.3. So both of those are fine. They've just got two digits, 5, 1 and 6, 3. So our little two-digit system can store these numbers exactly. But let's see what happens when we add the two together. We want to produce another variable called r, which is x plus y. Well, that's easy enough. We've got 51 plus 6.3, and that should equal 57.3. But there's a bit of a problem. 57.3 actually has three digits, 5, 7, and 3. And our little system can't store three digit numbers, so it's going to have to round. What it's going to store is r equals 57. And that little 0 0.3 on the end is rounded away and lost. And what we have here is called floating point error. It's the difference between the actual result we might expect and the result that we get when we add using floating point systems due to their lack of precision. And this is not just our two digit system, this happens in real floating point pretty much all the time as well. So we've added together our two little variables and we've got the result of 51 plus 6.3 equals 57. Now it would seem, looking at these uh, values just here, that 57 is pretty much as good as we can do. I mean, our system only has a capability of two digits. How could we possibly get any better? But. Let's us have a look at a remarkable trick. Okay, we're going to create another variable. We'll call this one lowercase r. And to compute the value of lowercase r, we're going to use a very stupid looking expression. Very stupid looking, my Jew. It's actually ingenious. We've got lowercase r equals x minus capital R plus y. 
Capital R is x plus y, so if we subtract that from x and then we add on y, we should get 0. And if this was algebraic, that's exactly what we would get. But we're not dealing with algebra here, we are dealing with floating point. If we step through this thing, we're going to see something strange happen. OK, the first part of the expression is x minus capital R. Now x from before was 51, and capital R, which was the sum of x and y, was 57. 51 minus 57 equals negative 6. Now that's fine, that's only got one digit, so we can easily store that in our little two-digit floating point system. Moving on to the next part of the expression, we add on the y. So we've got negative 6 from before plus y, which is 6.3. Well, negative 6 plus 6.3 equals 0 0.3. And that is a remarkable number, 0 0.3. The astute among us may recognize 0 0.3 as being exactly the floating point error that we had from the first computation for capital R. When we computed 51 plus 6.3, we had a floating point error of exactly 0 0.3. And now, We've got two variables. We've got capital R, which equals the upper two digits of a result. And we've also got lowercase r, which equals whatever lower digits that uh, capital R couldn't account for. And we could use the two in tandem, two doubles at once, or a double double, if you will, to store exactly 57.3. And this kind of technique is the core to double double arithmetic. And it might seem a little silly and trivial with our little two digit system just here, but if you do the same thing with 15 digit doubles using a real computer, you end up with something like 30 digits of accuracy. You just compute a result, you compute the floating point error in that result using your little system, and then you use the two in tandem to double your precision. It's pretty much that easy. Mr. T.J. Decker, or Dirk to his mates, he was a Dutch mathematician, born in 1927, he was a professor over there in uh, sunny Amsterdam, and he was the co-founder of Informatic Institute. So this guy is an absolute legend, here is a picture of him, and just looks so cool, kind of like a slightly more blonde version of Moss from IT Crowd. T.J. Decker is known in the computer science world for a couple of things. For one thing, he was the first person to solve the problem of how to implement mutual exclusion, which is essentially how to create a mutex. Mutexes, of course, are absolutely indispensable part of uh, today's modern world with our multi-core programming. His solution to this problem was attributed as the first correct solution by none other than Mr. Edsker Dijkstra himself. Today, that solution is called Decker's algorithm. But apart from this, in 1971, he wrote a paper called A Floating Point Technique for Extending Available Precision. And in this paper, he describes an absolutely amazing technique of using uh, two doubles at once to store floating point results. And this trick pretty much doubles the precision of floating point computation, and it gives you something like 30 accurate digits. The technique today is known as double-double arithmetic, and it can actually be extended further. You could use four doubles, and quadruple your precision, or you could use oct double or hex double. But after quad doubles, it actually becomes really computationally intensive. So at kind of that point, you're better off switching to an arbitrary precision library or maybe using uh, big integers and fractions. So TJ Decker was not the first person to conceive a lot of the ideas that we're about to go through. And he is clear about this in his paper from 1971. During the late 60s and the early 70s, there was a lot of authors were writing about various techniques to deal with uh, error detection and correction in floating point arithmetic. Mr. Decker here was the first person who systematically collected all of the ideas together into a single system of arithmetic and specifically applied them towards doubling the precision. And so it's for this reason that I'm going to refer to the four operations as Decker addition, Decker subtraction, Decker multiplication, and Decker division. Before we dive into that, I just want to explain the representation that I'll be using. And if you find my representation a little bit confusing, I will leave links to Decker's paper so that you can have a look at a different rendering of the same ideas. He presented his code in Algol at the end of the paper. So if you'd like another take, have a look at the original paper. 
Okay, moving on to the representation, I'm going to use Algerian, this special font, to represent a double double. A equals 281.6. In our little two digit system, that's a, that's a double double. And then to represent the upper half of that, I'm going to use a capital letter. So we could say that capital A equals 280 or 280, the upper two digits. And then for the lower half, I'll use a lowercase a. So we could say that lowercase a equals uh, 1.6. That's pretty much all there is to this notation. We've got Algerian represents the double double itself. Capital letters represent the upper half of the double double. And lowercase letters represent the lower half of ye olde double double. This is difficult to say. I tell you, it's too much double double. And uh, let's turn our attention now to the first operation, Decca addition. Okay, so I'll show the code at the end, but let's just step through an example with a bunch of digits just so that we can see how this kind of works. Let's say that we've got double doubles A and B. A is set to 37.51 and B is set to 126.8. And what we want to do is add them both together to produce the double double C. So we got C equals A plus B. And once again, we're using our little two digit system, but in reality, when you code this, it works with 64 bit doubles. Okay, so if you have a bit of a look at this, we've got A equals 37.51, which means that capital A is 37 and lowercase a is 0.51. That's just the upper and lower halves. And then we've got B equals 126.8. The upper half of B is 120 and the lower half is 6.8. If we want to compute C, what we kind of want to do is just add all of those together. We've got uppercase A plus uppercase B plus lowercase A plus lowercase B equals C. But we've got to be careful to maintain as much precision as we possibly can throughout the operation. And it's actually a little bit fiddly. In a way, what we've got to do is sort of close to normal addition. If we had two two digit numbers, say 27 and 56, if we had to add these two together, then we sort of start on the right hand side and we say 6 plus 7 equals 13. The 1 just there becomes a carry. It's like an overflow from the lower digits into the upper digit of the result. So we put the carry up here, then we write the 3 down here, and then we add the 5 and the 2 and the carry to get 83. That's two digit addition and that's quite similar to what we've got to do here. When we add the two lower elements of our double doubles, we might have some carry or some overflow into the upper part of the result. But we also have an extra nuance because when we add the two upper parts of our double doubles, the capital A plus the capital B, we might have some floating point error. And that floating point error has to be added to the lower part of the result. So we've actually got to compute that floating point error from the upper half and then add to that floating point error the lowercase a and the lowercase b. And only then can we check if there's overflow or carry into the upper part. So it's a little bit fiddly, it's a little bit strange, but that's basically what we've got to do in this algorithm. The first step in Decker's addition process is to compute R, which is the addition of the upper halves of our double doubles. Capital R equals capital A plus capital B, which is uh, 37 plus 120. And if we sum those two together, you'll find that the answer is 157. But since we're using only a little two digit system, we can't actually store 157 and that has to be rounded to the nearest two digits. Capital R just here is going to become 160. So the upper half of the final result, capital C, it should be somewhere around 160. But we still got to deal with the overflow or carry from adding the lower parts of our double doubles. Now we just added two doubles capital A and capital B to produce R. Uh, we had to store 160 instead of 157. So the next step is to figure out the error in that calculation. And we're gonna call this lowercase r. We've already seen how to compute this error. So lowercase r for us will equal capital B minus capital R plus A. Now you'll notice that the A and the B have switched around from where they were in our initial example way back at the start of the video. And the reason is what we want to do is subtract this R just here from the larger of A or B and then add on the other at the end. If you do this the wrong way around, you actually end up throwing away a bunch of precision at the start of the operation. So there's a little if statement in the algorithm. If the absolute of capital A is greater than the absolute of capital B, 
then lowercase r equals capital A minus capital R plus capital B. Otherwise, lowercase r equals capital B minus capital R plus capital A. You have to be a little bit careful about which is larger out of uh, capital A or capital B. Anyway, for us, we've got uh, capital B. It's actually the larger out of capital A and capital B, so we would use the else clause. We've got lowercase r equals capital B minus capital R plus capital A which will come out to be uh, 120 minus 160 plus 37. And if we just do that sort of one step at a time, we get negative 40 plus 37. And finally, we get negative three as the result in lowercase r, which is indeed the error from uh, capital R. Capital R was going to be 157, but it actually rounded up to 160. So the error there is negative three. So this lowercase r just here will be somewhere in the lower part of our final result when we're done computing. But we've also got to add the two lower elements of our inputs. So the next step is lowercase r equals lowercase r plus lowercase a plus lowercase b. Just add all of these little elements together. We'll start by adding lowercase a. So we've got negative three plus 0 0.51 gives us negative 2.5. Then if we add lowercase b, we get negative 2.5 plus 6.8 gives you 4.3. That is the value of our lowercase r. Notice that in all of these expressions, I step through it one at a time, performing one operation at a time. If you just punch the whole expression into your calculator and then round at the end, you'll get different results. Be careful when you're trying to work out how floating point will actually compute something. And remember that it rounds between every operation. Anyway, we've got uh, lowercase r equals 4.3. Right, good. What does that mean? Well, uh, we're very close to the actual answer at this point, but we've reached an interesting stage in the computation. We just added together a bunch of these little components, the smaller components. There might actually be a carry, so to speak, or an overflow from that addition. And what that means is that there might be some data that's currently stored in lowercase r, which would better be described in the upper half of our final result. And we want, if we can, to allow that data to overflow into a capital C when we save our final result. So that's what we've got to take care of now, just divvying out the data so that it's shared out properly so that the upper half of our final result can store as much information as possible. And then the lower part of our final result can just be dedicated to storing as much precision as possible. So we say capital C equals capital R plus lowercase r. And all that that's going to do is it's going to take the upper part of the result that we've computed so far in this capital R, and because we're adding lowercase r, any data that can overflow and be stored in this uppercase C will overflow. And at this point, we are done computing the upper half of our final result, capital C. So for us, we've got 160 plus 4.3 gives you 164.3, but we have to round, so that's going to become 160. And in our case, there was no overflow from lowercase r to capital R, but there might have been. And that is the upper half of the final result, 160. Capital C is computed. Let's turn our attention to lowercase c. Now, lowercase c is going to be something like lowercase r. It will be the same in our particular example here, but we have to be a little bit careful because if there was overflow just then in the computation of capital C, we actually want to remove that from lowercase r before we add it to lowercase c. So the final computation for lowercase c becomes lowercase c equals capital R minus capital C plus lowercase r. And for us, we get 160 minus 160 plus 4.3. So we get lowercase c equals 4.3. And we have our final result. Ladies and gentlemen, we have performed a double, double arithmetic addition. Well done. <laughs> it was complicated, it was fiddly, but we did it. We have got the double, double c, which is equal to the sum of double doubles a plus b. Capital C equals 160 and lowercase c equals 4.3. And if we just write that out as a single unit, as a double-double, the answer is 164.3. We had uh, 37.51 and 126.8. If you add those two numbers together, you actually get 164.31. So our double-double result is indeed very accurate. It is actually the closest that you can possibly get.
Uh, anyway, that was uh, fairly long-winded, but that is an example of how you add together double doubles. And here is the C code, or C++ sort of pseudo code. No, I think it's normal code. So you'll notice this if abs just here. Just be careful of your abdominal muscles. Okay, and for subtraction. So subtraction is actually really similar to addition, except you just subtract instead of adding, uh, but otherwise it's pretty much the same algorithm. So we won't step through that. I'll just show the code. So that's DECA addition and DECA subtraction. Now for DECA multiplication and DECA division, I think I might split that into another um, video just because it's very, it's uh, quite complicated in and of itself. Um, so look out for that in the very near future. For today, I guess we're done. I just want to say a great big thank you for watching this video. I hope it was uh, interesting and I hope we see you again in the next video. DECA multiplication and DECA division. Have a good one all. Cheers. Thanks for watching.